Good afternoon and welcome to Ramona's Roundtable. I'm your host Ramona Rachel Gittens and this is an episode brought to you by Link. I've heard about Dr. Sebi for many years um, and he's sort of a legend that I uh, haven't really been able to sort of get to. I haven't really understood a lot of his philosophy. A lot of it is because I haven't heard much of it one-on-one. -on -one. So this is actually an honor for me today and I'm glad that everyone who's listening to this is able to uh, join us. And this looks like it's going to be a two-part conversation and it looks like it's also going to be very, very interesting. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sebi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank um, you so very much. I would like to uh, let you start by sort of telling you, telling us your story from the beginning. Uh, I'm interested sort of in where you are now because I've heard, I've heard a lot about you over the years, but sort of starting from the beginning and um, you could just maybe before you do that for people who don't know you give an, intro, an, inter, an introduction and sort of an overview. Thank you. Quick. I was born in Spanish Honduras in the year of 1933. I was born in a small village named Milanga. Uh, the boy grew up, never going to school, whether kindergarten, high school, grade school, or whatever. Became a merchant seaman. But by the time he became a merchant seaman, he was very deadly ill. He had diabetes. He had asthma from birth. He was impotent at 28. And at 30, he had diabetes, asthma, obesity, and insanity. And with the help of Mexican people, I was cured. I decided to enter the field of natural medicine. Can I can I interrupt you for a quick second? Of course. I'm sorry. Um, when you when you started off, you were referring to yourself in a third person, and you switched to the first person. Do you see who you were earlier in your life as a, as sort of a, a a different person, as though you sort of become yourself in the in the second half of your life? I was always a different person. I disagree with everything. I disagreed with everything. Everything I heard, I disagreed with. Right. And I was 14 years of age when I said uh, I was going to work. I was working since I was 11 because my grandmother raised me. And I was, she was my responsibility to take care of paying the rent, buying her clothes, buying the food. So, but I had, the, I was tall and, and I was very, I suppose, sensible. So I just grew up and at 14, I made a statement that I was going to do something to help humanity. But when I made that statement, I also knew that I was going to come up against the established or prevailing philosophy of life that I knew at 14 years of age. But I didn't know that one day that I would become the person that I'm known for today as being the healer. I didn't know that. But even when I be, even before I became the healer, you know, I didn't have a girlfriend until I was 21 because I disagreed with what I saw. And even now, my interrelationship with women, I don't believe that there is a woman that could rightfully say that they love me because of the way that I live and the way that I see things. And I'm not really um, upset or bothered by that, but I live different. I see different. I feel different. And I don't like to share that with most people because it is so far away. You know, you don't want to disturb anyone. But when I, even the healing that I bring to the world, look at that. When I, my first patient, my very first patient, I was a steam engineer working for the county of Los Angeles. And this blind man had heard that I was experimenting with these plants. And his neighbor said, well, why don't you take it? And he took the plants, and in two days he was seeing. And he was blind for 11 years. That shook me, because I couldn't explain to the world the mechanics behind this blind man seeing. What, what, were, what were your thoughts when you formulated the... Uh... The compound. Right, right. The way that the compounds came into existence, mm -hmm. was being a steam engineer, mm -hmm. I knew mm -hmm that the pH value, the pH factor, mm -hmm. had a lot to do with healing. 
And the herbalists then, like the herbalists today, are unaware that the pH factor has a lot to do with it. Meaning this, I said that if God tell us that the herbs are for the healing of the nations, mm -hmm. in the book of Genesis, in the book of Ezekiel, in the book of Exodus, and the book of Revelation, it says that the herbs are for the healing of the nation. Then as I go further into the history of medicine, this is what I found, that the great Hippocrates used herbs to cure disease and that he cured every disease known to man. This man was curing every disease in Greece. 365 years before Christ was even born. So when people tell us that only Jesus heals, you remind them that Hippocrates was here long before he was born, 300 years. So I said, if Jesus cured with herbs, Hippocrates cured with herbs, and God said the herbs, then what's up? Why aren't we curing with herbs today? Mm -hmm. So I said, one day when I went to work, my wife and I was talking all night. We were engaged in this, in this conversation about these herbs. So Maa said to me that there could be something locked someplace that prevent us from accomplishing the goals that Jesus Christ and Hippocrates accomplished. When I went to work that night, I found it. I laughed. Oh, I was so happy. I was extremely happy because I said, it is required of us to maintain the pH at 6.9. At 7, which is, the, which is the neutral zone, pH of 7 is neutral. And if it is slightly on the acid side, it's 6.9. And the reason why we maintain the pH at 6.9 is to keep the tubes of the boiler clean, that there will be no life form in there. But if the pH is 7.1, oh, now you're going to experience life. Mm -hmm. Life form will begin to accumulate in the tubes of the boiler, preventing the radiant heat or the convection heat mm -hmm. from reaching the tubes. I said that if life was so powerful that it could exist in a temperature of 450 degrees, then the herbs that heal would have to be alkali on 7 plus instead of acid 6.9. Then I begin to check the pH of all the herbs. I begin to test it. I test comfrey, acid. I test garlic, acid. I also tested aloe vera, St. John wort, rose hips, comfrey, all of these things are very acid. Carrot juice is extremely acid, yet the healers in New York then and now are still recommending these acid foods. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, let me investigate further to see which are the alkali herbs. Mm -hmm. And I begin to see that burdock, yellow dock, also, the uh, elderberry, mm -hmm. these are alkali plants. Also, the Virginia snake root, that's alkali. One has to know the herbs that are alkali opposed to the herbs that are acid. This today is not really considered, nor do they follow that particular you know, uh, road or understanding. Because the herbalists of today are recommending peppermint, Peppermint is very acid. Mm -hmm. Peppermint freezes the brain. Some even recommend peppermint oil. Peppermint oil is extremely caustic. Mm -hmm. So now we have this kind of information in front of us being disseminated and carried out. Mm -hmm. So there's confusion in the population. But the one thing that my supporters or the people that helped me, that counseled me, they said to me, Sebi, the one thing that you have in your favor is that you, are, you have cure and you are curing the diseases that others are not curing. So that is the barometer that tells us that the acid herb that they are using prevent them from reaching the goal that they are pursuing. Mm -hmm. It was my steam engineering experience that helped me in herbology. 
to understand the earth that God made. Yes, it has to be made by God. If we eat something that God didn't make, we are running the risk of disease. Then we're going to be angry. Like I were at only 30 years of age, I was extremely angry. So I didn't know that I would, my mother wanted me to be a preacher. And I didn't want to go into the church. I said, who, me be a preacher? No, I'm not going to be a preacher. Mm. And look what I'm doing now. Mm. Look what I'm doing. My mother, I called her on my birthday two days ago, and she was laughing. She was laughing. She said, you see, what I wanted you to do, what I see you doing, you're doing it. Only because people are being healed. Mm. That is the work of a shepherd. So if we were to sort of go back and trace everything, um, as a young man you had a sense that you would heal people. You didn't know quite how you would do it. Uh, you went through as a, to become a, a, a young man in your early 20s. Um, and you were still unhealthy yourself, but you started to look into herbs. No, I didn't look into herbs in my 20s. I didn't know anything about herbs in my 20s. No. I made a statement at 14 mm -hmm. that I was going to do something right. to help humanity. Right. But I didn't know it was going to turn out to be these herbs. Mm -hmm. So when I was sick, mm -hmm. I was 30. Okay. And I got the help from the Mexican that helped me. Mm -hmm. And then I, I proceeded to pursue it. Mm -hmm. And I was working as a steam engineer at the time that I, every day I would go to work. And God would talk to me and said, how could you be healed? of all those dreadful diseases, and you're gonna hold that from humanity? And I would go to work and I would see these turbines and these condensers and these boilers, and I would get so angry. And that was when I stepped up my research. You see these boilers, what would make you angry about them? Because I wanna get, get away from them, because I wanna go into the herbs. Okay. But I was then 47 years of age. Mm -hmm. I was 47. Mm -hmm. And I was 10 years on the job, seniority. Mm -hmm. And I was making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And I had a wife and two babies and one on the way. And I quit my job. God said, you're going to quit. If you're going to starve, you're going to die starving. But you're going to quit this job. Mm -hmm. And I left. And I was put in jail. And, you know, all the whole bit that happened to me in New York. I was arrested in, in, in St. Martin one night. I was taken to jail in, a, in Curacao. Oh, it's been a, it's been a journey. But it's been nice. Because it was like a test. Mm -hmm. I remember being down to only $400. When I started this business, I only had five, $400. Mm -hmm. I started this healing journey with $400. And here I am today. A little girl in New York named Haja that was brought to us with a hole in her heart. She's now 16. A little girl was brought to me in Atlanta that was blind from age 8 to age 11 with a tumor on her frontal lobe. She no longer had the tumor on her frontal lobe. Her name is Mecca. And there's a little girl in Minnesota. Her name is Akila Stroud. She no longer has sickle cell anemia. And some month, a month ago, I gave a lecture in New York, and a young lady came forth and said, Well, I don't have lupus anymore. So these kinds of things tells us that we, the black race, has the answer to the world's health. We have the answer to, to, to their disease state. Mm -hmm. But we are afraid to take that responsibility because we live in fear. We fear. We, we scare the white man. We scare of, of God. We say that we fear God. I don't know why people fear God. Now, is it possible for one group to have the cures for the, for the world? Because uh, your, part of your philosophy, is, or I don't want to say your philosophy, um, part of your outlook or your beliefs is that uh, people are at their healthiest when they're eating foods that come from the region of their ethnic origin. That's not happening. Right, but that's what you believe. No, I don't believe that either. What I believe is to eat food mm -hmm. that is came out of the product of life itself. Mm -hmm. I don't care whether you're Chinese, Eskimo, Arab, or what. If you eat something natural, mm -hmm. you're going to be healed. But do you believe that, that, that people, for instance, 
that the black people should not eat foods that are oh, not indigenous. Oh no, to that's a horse of a different color. Black people should not eat Chinese food because Chinese food or even Caucasian food. Mm -hmm. There is a book out by a man known as Pavo Ariola, and he is known to be one of the most distinguished uh, nutritionists in the world. Mm -hmm. And he said that if your ancestors are from Africa, mm -hmm. your body is not programmed to digest milk. Mm -hmm. But if you are European, yes. So right there they're telling us that there's a difference in the genetic makeup of, this indi of these two individuals. So if people have a different genetic makeup that makes them react differently to different uh, herbs, products, foods, would it be possible for one group to have sort of the cure for the entire world, or would you have, a, or would they be moving towards a cure for people of the, within the same ethnic group? Well, it should be like that, I suppose. But our experience shows us. That it crosses all lines. That it crosses all, all boundaries. Because mm -hmm. people come to us. There was once upon a time where there were m more white people coming to us. Mm -hmm. Chinese come to us. Japanese. Mm -hmm. I just said that Matun just killed a woman in Japan of lung cancer. And she never seen the woman. They called from Japan and told Matun, like Annette, mm -hmm. have cured many. Matun have cured many, so it's Tatanisha. And they have never seen these people. She sent them the compound to Japan, and she was killed. Mm -hmm. We sent compound to Europe, and they were killed. I have a letter from a psychiatric group in France who want me to go and lecture to them. Why? Because someone with schizophrenia was killed that they know about. Mm -hmm. So these compounds killed everyone, whether you're black, white, Chinese, or Eskimo, mm -hmm. providing they are natural. But the substance that you're going to eat as a staple, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. I agree with you. You are 100% right. It has to be something that is genetically oh, consistent actually, no. with you. Okay. No, I wasn't actually. I wasn't saying that, um, and I'm not not saying that either because I don't. I don't know it. Um, it's, uh, it's something I'm asking you. But about. you did. It well, was good. I've, I've heard that you said that. So yeah, but I was but it, it, it was correct. Okay. It's, it's apropos. Okay. Um, and I'd like to hear a little bit about that in terms of people and the relationship between the staple diet and where your ancestors okay. are from. Okay. We we're gonna give you an example, a good example. From the day that God created this universe uh -huh. and made black people, how many years it has been since God placed black people in Africa? Do you have any idea? The anthropologist has no idea, but it would spout out these numbers for you uh -huh. that God made the universe 9.5 billion years ago. Uh -huh. So the other is, when did he put black people in Africa? They say 1.5 million years ago. Mm -hmm. But what was the food that God placed in Africa for these people? Certainly, it could not have been potatoes. It could not have been rice or beans or yams or chicken or hogs or cows. It could not be a goat or a lamb because all these things are hybrid. Mm -hmm. God did not make these things. These things came just recently, only 4,000 years ago. So what were we eating in Africa before we were taken away? What were we eating in Africa before there was an invasion by the man from Europe? We simply do not know. Mm -hmm. And it is because we are unaware of this diet that God made specifically for us. This is why we're angry today and we're so divided. Everybody's laughing at us. They're laughing more at me. On the airplane, the pilots came to see me a few weeks ago when I was in a plane before 911, and they were looking at the brochure that I had that says, that AIDS has been cured, and herbalists cure AIDS, and the Supreme Court of New York cannot deny, can't disagree. They were laughing at me. Why? Because you are not supporting me. So they think that I'm a fake. Because if it was a white man curing AIDS, the captain said, the whole white race would be supporting them, but my race is not going to support me. The leaders of America can't do it. Firecon can't do it. Jesse Jackson can't do it. Because they were not designed to do this kind of work. They were designed to lobby and to talk and to, like Mr. Al Sharpton, he likes to make people march. That's cool. But we got a job to do in healing the black race now. That comes in a different category. Those leaders cannot help me. Yeah. And that's why I'm vulnerable. In what ways is the black race in need of healing? In what way? Ways. Is that the, the bl black race need healing? Mm -hmm. One of the areas that the black race need healing most is in the central 
nerve system. Mm -hmm. Because we have been eating acid food for 400 years. And how does that manifest itself in terms of? Socially. S socially, physically, and physically. what's the damage that? Okay, socially we see that very seldom our leaders agree with their own selves. The, the leaders are at war. Mm -hmm. They're all in disagreement because among the leaders, you find Muslims, you find Christian, you find Buddhists, you find all of that. And they all seem to disagree with each other's position. Mm -hmm. The politician, well, I don't know what role politics play in our, pro in our progression health state. Mm -hmm. How we see it, again, is that we are not together on any issue that is pragmatic, that's going to elevate us in producing something for our own existence. Self-preservation is the first law of nature. And we are the only people on the planet that denies that. Okay, so I guess uh, there, there are a few things I want to pull out of what you just said. Um, the first one is our relationship between uh, diet and behavior. Mm -hmm. Diet and behavior has a direct re their, their relationship. Okay, and then that this is affecting black Americans in a particular way uh, so that it's something you can see throughout um, our community and would the difference be that uh, black Americans are not in their sort of original like homeland and so that that would be why there'd be a, a greater problem with for black Americans temperature and food temperature and but food. not so much as the African do you know that black America on the scale from 1 to 10 mm -hmm. if we are to be perfect at 10 Black America is about five. Africa is about two. Black America is closer to the gold than Africa. You're talking about food or diet? I mean diet or, or behavior? Di diet and behavior. Okay. Because if, you, if a young man in California is in love with you, that you met, he's not going to ask you what tribe are you a member of, right? No, you're not. Right. But in Africa, if you are Susu, and I'm a Malenke, I'm not going to marry you. Because mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be your enemy. But they're both black. You see? Mm -hmm. In America, the brother not going to ask you what tribe you're a member of. He's going to marry you because he like you. Right? And you with him. That's only one. But do you think that being concerned about the tribe a person is from means that you, them, and any of your offspring will always be linked, at least in traditional society, will be linked to a certain geographic region, and you won't have the problem that you described of being sort of removed from the area where vegetation okay, that is that would be good. adapted for. That would be good, and I agree with you. But there's one other part of it, mm -hmm. is that the African people are eating a food that is so detrimental that you didn't have. And... See, the African people is eating cassava. Mm -hmm. Cassava is cyanide, pure cyanide, unadulterated. You didn't have that. Mm -hmm. And because you didn't have the cyanide, you were able to produce plastics. You were able to produce rubber. You were able to build the White House. You were able to produce electricity. You were able to produce agriculture. The African men and no other black man in the world has ever done that that shows that black America, even though taken away from motherland and given meat, which is responsible for our anger, mm -hmm. we are still able to do things that is over and above any other race in the world. The black race has proven that. And now that another one comes, your brother and servant, Dr. Sebi, it is not so surprising that he's curing AIDS and sickle cell. You know something? Curing AIDS is easy. Mm -hmm. Curing sickle cell is like play for me. Diabetes, we cure 10 a month. Yet, there aren't any centers in Germany that is beset with, with um, diabetes. There aren't centers in the United States that cure diabetes. We cure diabetes. Now, what are we going to do now? I would like to hear the excuse. I would like for someone to take this particular uh, entity Mm -hmm. to the leaders of America, and I would like to hear the excuse that they're going to give us mm -hmm. for not supporting it. Okay. Well, um, I think what you just said will actually bring us to 
our next discussion, we're going to need to close this up. Um, but I think what we'll be talking about next is uh, your struggles here in New York in terms of being recognized for your work um, and having some acknowledgement for your, for your healing. So thank you for this. Went by so quickly, it felt like it's just been a minute, but uh, that's okay because we'll be talking again. So thank you for joining us, and this has been another episode of, of Ramona's Roundtable. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you.